Yesterday we defined total internal reflection as this phenomenon whereby light that normally refracts or bends when it goes into a new medium doesn't go into the new medium at all, rather it reflects off of the boundary. Now that doesn't happen all the time. In fact, most times it doesn't happen. But under certain circumstances, it can. When we have a situation, let's draw this down here actually, We've got a little bit more space. We have a situation where we're going from a high index of refraction to a low index of refraction, there's a chance. But even that's not enough. If you're going from low to high index of refraction, you'll never get total internal reflection. If you're going from high to low, you might get total internal reflection. Now, the other thing that's required besides going from high to low index of refraction is that the angle of incidence is big enough. When you're going from high to low, n goes down, theta goes up, we're always going to get that refracted angle or that refracted ray bending away from the normal line. But if we increase the angle of incidence to a certain point that we call the critical angle, then what we're going to find is that angle of refraction ends up being big enough that the ray of light actually skips along the boundary between the high index and the low index. In that case, we would say the refracted angle is what? What is the angle of refraction here? If the angle of incidence is theta c, the angle of refraction in this case would be, look at it. Measured from the normal line, the red line is 90 degrees. We're going to use that in a few minutes. Okay, we're going to use that in a few minutes to determine what the critical angle is. So, bottom line is, in order for to get this reflection taking place rather than refraction, we need two things. We need to be going from high index to low index, water to air, diamond to glass, as opposed to the other way around, and we need to have an angle of incidence that is bigger than the critical angle, bigger than whatever we find that red angle right there to be. If we've got the green angle, it just refracts. If we've got the blue angle, which is bigger than the critical angle, then we would find that we would get reflection taking place. Now, we gave you uh, an example of where this kind of comes into play, um, an application of this yesterday. Remember we had that fish in the bottom of the pond. We'll make it a golf ball today in the bottom of the pond. Ray of light reflects off of that golf ball right here. Encounters the boundary between the surface, or sorry, between the water and the air, and then it's going to refract. You know that the angle of refraction is going to be bigger than the angle of incidence. Bigger because, well, we're going from high index to low index, and if n is decreasing, theta has got to be increasing. That means that the person standing on the shore over here will end up seeing this golf ball. But not where the golf ball really is. Remember we said yesterday that the golf ball would appear to be back here. So this person would see the golf ball, but the person would think the golf ball was not as deep, and the person would think the golf ball was a little bit further back than it really is. So the person backs up a bit. Person backs up to, whoops. Person backs up to this spot right here. All of a sudden now that ray of light that was refracting right into his or her eyes goes right over the head. So this person doesn't see it anymore. The person no longer thinks the golf ball is right here because that ray of light that tricked him or her into thinking it was there isn't shining into his eyes anymore. So, now we try a different ray of light. Let's make it a purple one this time. Reflecting off of the golf ball, coming up here. Strikes the boundary at an angle that was bigger than the yellow incident angle. So theta 1 yellow is smaller than theta 1 purple. Now, theta 1 purple is bigger, so it may actually be bigger than the critical angle. And if it is bigger than the critical angle, then that purple ray won't refract into the guy's eyes at all, but rather it will reflect. What does the guy see? Nothing, just the top of the pond, right? Top of the river. We don't see down into there because the ray of light that would be required to be refracted into his eyes doesn't refract. Rather, it reflects. Now, if he was to see this, he was to look at this golf ball with this ray of light. We said this yesterday. He'd have to be lying on the bottom of the pond right there, conscious, lying on the bottom of the pond, and he would end up seeing this golf ball up here somewhere. But the golf ball doesn't look like it's floating in the air because 
he would see an image of the water up there as well. And he would see the image of any plants up there as well and any fish up there as well. So he would look up, he would see the pond. He would look down and he would see the pond. So he'd probably be a little bit confused actually. He'd be neutrally buoyant and he would look up and down and see the same thing. Now, I want to give you another example now, or another application of this now. What's this? Yeah, it's a diamond. Don't worry about the numbers there. Um, they're not, I was going to say they're irrelevant. They're not irrelevant, actually, but they're not important to you. The numbers for us don't, don't, don't matter. The shape of a diamond from the side as a, as a cross section is always cut this way. It doesn't matter whether it's a round diamond from the top or square or rectangular or oval. It doesn't make any difference. Okay, from the side, we always want it to look like this. And the reason we want it to look like this is because the angles are optimized to produce the maximum amount of sparkling. There's four things when you buy a diamond that you care about. Okay, if you, guys, when you go to buy a diamond someday, um, maybe they'll explain this to you. Okay, one of the things is color. Generally, we want our diamonds to be, have no color. Although, sometimes, if they're like a deep color, diamonds can have a deeper color, then they're particularly rare, and they end up being more valuable in that case. But most times, we want the diamonds to be no color. Second C is clarity. Okay, four Cs. Color, clarity. We want them to be clear. So we don't want them to be foggy, because nobody wants a diamond ring that is kind of foggy. Ladies, if somebody gives you a diamond ring sometime and it's kind of like, it looks a little hazy, um, you should probably say no to that guy because he's, he's cheap. Okay. The third one is carrots, the size of the diamond. The carrots are the size of the diamond. So we've got um, color, clarity, carrots. Obviously, the bigger the diamond, the more that it's worth, right? And the fourth C is the cut of the diamond. This is the way that it needs to be cut so as to maximize the sparkling, which is one of the big appeals to diamonds. Most times, light enter when light enters a diamond, it enters from above, right? You've got your hand out here. The light enters the diamond from above. So we're going to draw a ray of light coming from above here into the diamond. Now, it's going straight in, so it's not going to change direction, but it will change speed dramatically. It goes from 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second in the air to 1 point something times 10 to the 8 meters per second in the diamond. Okay, it slows down by a factor of 2.4. Now that, that, uh, that light, that ray of light, as it strikes the boundary now between the diamond and the air, we see that it strikes it at a certain angle that we call theta 1. Now, theta 1 may or may not be bigger than the critical angle. Theta 1 it has more chance of being bigger than the critical angle for diamond than it does for other materials like glass. The reason being is that the difference in index of refraction is so big. This is 2.42, this is 1.00. The bigger the difference in the index of refraction between the two materials, the smaller the critical angle and therefore the easier it is to exceed the critical angle. Does that make sense? I think we find when we calculate the critical angle for diamond and air, it's about 24 degrees. When we look at it for glass and air, I think it's 40-something degrees. So it's a lot easier to have an angle that's bigger than 24 than it is to have an angle that's bigger than 48, right? Make sense? Now, assuming that theta 1 is bigger than the critical angle, and it has a much better chance of being bigger than the critical angle for diamond than it does for any other material, then this ray of light is not going to refract like it might in glass, but rather it's going to reflect. So it's going to bounce off like this. And then it's going to hit the boundary between the diamond and the air on the other side. If theta was bigger than theta c on the left side, and if this is cut right, then theta is going to be bigger than theta c on the right side as well. And therefore, we're going to find that, once again, it reflects. Now, we see things when light changes direction. You see me, I see you when light reflects off of us. Sometimes you see the boundary between glass and air because light refracts. It, change, it, it just bends. We can see 
boundaries when light changes direction. But we see sparkling glimmers or sparkles when light specifically reflects. So what do we see here? We see a little sparkle right there when that light reflects off of that boundary. We see a sparkle right here when light reflects off of this boundary. In glass, what do you see? Well, if this ray of light came in and refracted out, we would see the boundary between glass and air. But we wouldn't see a sparkle like we see when the light reflected off of the diamond air boundary. That's why diamonds sparkle more, because we get more reflection taking place. And why do we get more reflection taking place? Because the critical angle for diamond is so low that it's easy to exceed it. Now, we do want to have it cut right so that we can maximize the amount of reflection that's taking place. You'll still get reflection even if you cut it poorly, but you'll get less of it. Maybe it bounces off of the first side and you get a sparkle, but maybe it refracts out the second side. One sparkle instead of two sparkles for each of the rays of light. Make sense? Guys, you know what to look for? Yeah. Girls, you know what to look for. Okay. <laughs> now, how do we calculate that critical angle? How do we determine the critical angle for diamond or for glass or for water for that matter? Let's draw a little picture over here. Here's my, here's my boundary, here's my normal line, and we know we're going from high to low index here at fraction, right? That's a given. We're going from high to low. So whatever the values are, it doesn't matter. You know what, actually, since we're dealing with specifically with water here, let's, uh, let's make this water, let's make this air, because presumably we're going from water to air, right? We know we've got to be going from the water to the air, as opposed to the other way around, because we know we've got to be going from high to low index refraction. That means that the ray of light is coming from here, or you could say from the other side, as long as it's not coming from the air. Actually, we want to find the critical angle, right? The critical angle occurs, it occurs when the ray of light skips off of the boundary and right along that boundary between the air and the water. What do we say the angle of refraction was again when we've reached the critical angle? 90 degrees. So why don't we just do this? Why don't we just use Snell's law, sine theta 1 over sine theta 2 equals n2 over n1. And as we do that and substi make substitutions, let's substitute theta c for theta 1. So instead of calling it sine theta 1, let's call it sine theta c, critical angle. And for theta 2, let's sub in. 90 degrees. For theta 2, let's sub in 90 degrees. For sine theta 2, it would be 1, right? So sine 90 degrees ends up being equal to 1. So what you end up finding when you're solving for the critical angle is that it always ends up being this. Sine theta c is equal to n2 over n1, because sine 90 is just 1. So it always disappears. You can set it up like I have, or you can just remember sine theta 2 is equal to n2 over n1, or sine theta c, I should say, is equal to n2 over n1. And that makes the critical angle equal to the inverse sine of n2 over n1, which is, in this case, the inverse sine of 1.00 over 1.33. It's coming from medium 1, which is water, and it's going to medium 2, which is air. Let's, let's do this on our calculator. Everybody pull out your calculator and follow, this along, follow along with me on this one. There's two things that I want to show you here with this. First one, theta c is the, is the inverse sign. Make sure you're in degree mode. The inverse sign of 1 over 1.33. That's the first thing we do to get the correct answer, 48.8 degrees. So the critical angle between water and air is 48.8 degrees. That's a pretty big critical angle. You're not going to make a ring out of, out of water, so you don't need to worry about a critical angle with water in the context of the diamond ring, but you can see that um, if we do in fact have a critical angle for diamond that's 24 degrees, 
we're going to get um, much more reflection taking place in diamond than we would in something else that has a higher angle like this. Now, try this. Everybody try this now before we move on. We said theta c is equal to the inverse sine of 1 over 1.33. It is really easy to mix up the indices of refraction in these questions. It's really easy to just make it 1.33 over 1, just by carelessness. If we're careful, we won't do that. But even when we're careful sometimes, you know, especially two hours into an exam, our mind is kind of shot and we're, we're making that mistake. Everybody do this on the calculator right now. The inverse sine of 1.33 divided by 1. What do you get? In these questions, they tell you. Your calculator will tell you if you've made a mistake. Like, it's hard to get these ones wrong. It's really hard to get a total internal reflection question wrong. Because there's only two variables that you've got to sub in. And if you mix them up, then your calculator won't do it for you. So change them. That make sense? You can't, you, you can't really get one of these wrong. Yeah, go ahead, Brent. Is there a different index of refraction for, like, man-made diamonds as opposed to uh, That's a good question. Um, now you hear advertised sometimes man-made diamonds or uh, diamonds made in a lab. Is there a different index of refraction? Um, if there is, it wouldn't be dramatic. Otherwise, it would be hard to call a diamond. Um, but... I, I could see there being a slight difference. Uh, I'm not really sure, actually. It's, that's something that I think is worth looking up. Yeah. Um, they say that you can get the man-made diamonds, basically a bigger diamond for the same price, same quality, bigger diamond, same price. But, yeah, it's not really the same quality if it has a different index of refraction, right? It's going to result in a little bit of a different reflection taking place. The higher the index, the better, obviously, right? All right. Okay, I'm going to ask you right now to work on the next three questions. It won't be long. Okay, you guys are going to solve these pretty quickly, but um, see what you can do with them. If you need help with them, just let me know, and we'll, we'll go over one or two of them.